I've been in the Lord now 38 years and counting. And um, the thing that hooked me as a, as a Jewish guy in, well, started out in Cleveland, Ohio, originally from Boston, Massachusetts. But I, I was singing uh, at the temple, part of a temple choir, um, nice Jewish boy. The cantor was my voice teacher, working, working on an undergraduate degree in music education. And um, I went to church with a girl. Uh, I figured out uh, as a young Jewish guy that the pretty girls went to church. So when a pretty girl invited me to church, I went. Um, 22 years old at the time, so it was um, a natural response. And uh, what, I, what I found when I went to church wasn't what I was expecting, but it was a setup. I found that uh, the Lord had a hook that he had placed in me and was not going to be satisfied until he had reeled me into the boat. A um, couple years went by, I moved to Italy and studied music and came back again. And that first experience with God had kind of faded by then until another pretty girl invited me to church. <laughs> and uh, I, I felt after a while that I had a t-shirt that said, uh, any pretty girl, please invite me to church. And um, so sure enough, uh, this pretty girl invited me to church. And again, I found another setup. The first time I went, years before, the whole message, the whole service was set up just to speak to me. It, it absolutely blew me away. I never expected anything that personal, that intimate in a place like that. Well, years passed, as I said, I went back again. I'm expecting, you know, the, there's three three uh, numbers up on the wall, you open up a book, you turn the page, you sing all 18 verses or whatever they have in there. It's boring, do, 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 do. And the service started with a guy who got up on a stool, played his guitar, the atmosphere in the whole place changed. And I didn't know what to do with myself. I felt trapped again, but in a nice way. All of a sudden, everything around me blurs. The atmosphere changes. I'm, it's like I'm hearing the voice of God. I don't know what that is, but I'm hearing for myself. And uh, a couple weeks later, I prayed to receive the Lord. Praise and worship, I, I say that to say this. Praise and worship, to me, obviously, in my life, has become so precious to me. Because of this, there's more, but because of this one fact that he inhabits the praises of his people. And as we offer up to him our sounds, our voices, our hearts, it provokes, you know, remember the woman with the issue of blood, she presses through a crowd. There's all kinds of commotion going on and, and hundreds, maybe thousands are pressing, pressing in on Yeshua. And in the midst of that, he turns around and he says to his disciples, who touched me? And, you know, one of the disciples says, come on, Lord, there, everybody's touching you. Everybody's touching you. There's another one of those English terms. Everybody's touching you. Well, they can't. But, but no, somebody by faith pressed through the crowd and took a hold because they were expecting to meet with God. That's what I love about praise and worship. Creates an atmosphere where we are we are pulling through the crowd, through all the noise. We're, we're pulling on the hem of his garments. Lord, I, I need you. I just, I just need to touch you today. I want to be, be close enough, face to face, like a man speaks to his brother. That statement that, that uh, Torah makes about Moses, that God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Come on, isn't that, you know, in Exodus 33, that is, ugh. That's so provoking. Sometimes, you know, I'll read that, and again, I'll say, well, what am I, Lord, chop liver? I, come on, give me, give me that face-to-face, -face, you know? And sometimes you'll say, you're just not ready. <laughs> you're just not ready for what you're asking for. But praise and worship and, and faithfulness, intimacy, 
is for me what it's all about. In, in fact, no, we'll, we'll skip that because we don't have time. I was going to start somewhere else. But look with me in uh, Genesis 22 and verse 1. We were, we were looking this morning. Asher was talking about faithfulness out of Luke and, uh, and just great stuff from him. And I thought I'd pick that up right here. Faithfulness in being a worshiper. In John chapter 4, I was going to go there, but you know it so well. I'll just refer to it. The story of the woman at the well and, and Yeshua reveals himself to her. Oh, you're a prophet. Well, yeah, but more than that. He said, a time is coming and has now come when those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. These are the kinds of worshipers that the Father is seeking. So I've said my entire life, Lord, this is what I want to be. I want to be what you're looking for. I want, you know, what says to me that when God is looking for something, he doesn't find it under every rock. You know, if, if you're going crawfish hunting down in the south, well, I'm from Florida now, and kids will go looking for crawfish. They, they look like tiny lobsters. You know, they got little tiny pinches on them. They're fast. They're fun to catch, but I don't know. Some people like to eat them. I like to catch them and let them go. But you got to look under a lot of rocks to find one. And it seems to me that that's what a worshiper is for God. When he's looking for them, it's not under every rock. Every seat does is not have a worshiper sitting on it. They might be in the meeting. But there is something special about what God calls a worshiper that may not exactly be what we think of when we think of a worshiper. In fact, let me, let me ask you, what do you think of, now, I'm going to get good answers from all of you, I, I know that, because this is a tough crowd, but what do you think of when you think of a worshiper? What does it mean to be a worshiper? If God is looking for worshipers, and that's obviously what you want to be, what do you have to be in order to be a worshiper of God? Sorry? Abandon to yourself as a worshiper. Good. I'm, I, there's going to be a lot of good answers. So come on, give me a few more. Don't be afraid. One answer? Abandon to yourself. A passion for God. It's good. A living sacrifice. See, I told you there's going to be a lot of good answers. Yeah, a personal relationship, right? Connect with God. A worshiper of God. What else? All right. For the, for the sake of time, we'll go with those for now. There's, there's some more. And get your, get your pen out. Okay, so in Genesis chapter 22... When, when I was saying, Lord, after reading John chapter 4, that's what I want. I want to be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. He said, well, let me take you over here and show you what it means. And then afterwards, you can tell me if this is still <laughs> what you want. All right? So follow me here. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Right out of the shoot. It says, sometime later. Sorry, I can't read it for you in Hebrew. I'll just have to stick with good old English. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Woohoo! Yes! That is not one of the verses I have up on my refrigerator. God tested Abraham. Because he said to me, look, if you want to be a worshiper in spirit and truth, I'm going to test you. <sighs> now, if you really want to be a worshiper, you can say, okay. David said it, test me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Shake it up, Lord. There's a popular song uh, in the West now, Shake It Off. <laughs> I'm sure you all know it. Come on, don't tell me you're not listening to, what is it, Katy Perry or Katy Did or whatever, whatever her name is. Uh, it's a very popular song now, Shake It Off, Shake It Off, Shake It Off. I don't know what she's talking about, but the chorus is Shake It Off, Shake It Off. So... There's something about a test. How many of you enjoy a test? I didn't think so. I, I don't either. I was a student for many years. 
and I was a teacher for a couple of years. And when it came test day, the thing, what do you hate most of all? Pop quizzes, right? All right, put your books away, take out a sheet of paper. Oh, I should have read those chapters last night because the pop quiz is all about what I should have done, but then I didn't do it, so you get to look like a dummy for that, for that day. But testing, if you want to be a worshiper, if you want to be found faithful, then God says, I'm going to test you. Why? Testing is not for him. Testing is for you. Testing is for me. It gives us kind of a, where am I in this whole thing? Lord, test me and see if there be anything in me. Shaking in life. You know why shaking is good? We don't like it. But it's good because it, it gets all the other false stuff off of us that we might be depending on. And then when the, when the heat comes down real hard, if we're holding on to something that's not true, what happens? The foundation falls out. And you get people falling away. You get people who are disappointed. You, you find out that friendships weren't what, they, what you thought they were. So testing is good. If you're a real worshiper, if you are a faithful person, you learn to enjoy the tests. You learn to enjoy the shaking because it reveals to you what is true and what's false. So if you want to be a worshiper, if you want to be faithful, then expect to be tested. But also, don't resist the tests. And be able to discern between tests and temptations, right? Because James tells us, or Jacob, says that God doesn't tempt anyone, but each one is tempted by their own evil desires, and they're dragged away and enticed, right? So, first of all, expect to be tested. Second of all, be able to discern when you're being tested by God, or you're being tempted by the enemy. The test is there to elevate you. The temptation comes to destroy you. Okay? Good. All right. Okay, that was part of verse 1. So he says to him, Abraham, Abraham, here's another aspect of a worshiper. A worshiper hears the voice of their father. God spoke to Abraham and he says, Abraham, he calls him by name. Hineni, here I am, he replied. Here's another aspect of a worshiper. So if you want to be a worshiper, number one, expect to be tested. Number two, discern between testing and temptation. One is to elevate you. The other is to destroy you. Number three, if you're going to be a worshiper, make sure you're hearing the voice of God. Did you see how much prophecy there was in our meeting this morning? Someone would say, let's pray, and eight people grab the microphone and say, I'm hearing God say this, I'm here." It was like, we almost don't pray, it's like a prophecy time. It's been like that forever with my friends uh, here at Revive. We, we go back to 1980, 1981. Was anybody alive back then? Really? 82. You just, you just missed the cut. Yeah. We, we go back in our friendships almost 40 years. It is amazing to me. But it's always been like that. We would get together. We begin to worship. The atmosphere changes. We say, let's pray. And we wind up, I hear the Lord saying this. And it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And he says to Abraham, Abraham. A son, a worshiper, a daughter, will hear the father's voice and a stranger's voice they will not follow. Now, notice there, it doesn't say that you can't hear the stranger's voice. It just says you pay no attention. In a room, I, I liken it like this. I have two boys. They're, they're now uh, grown with wives of their own. One has produced a grandson for me, so I brought him back into the will. He's now back in the will. 
because I have an ear. And they know my voice. They've heard my voice, not only, obviously, on CDs and videos and stuff, but they hear my voice at the dinner table. They've heard my voice, did you finish your homework? They heard my voice, come here, you need to be corrected. They know my voice. And so we can go to the mall, and in the midst of thousands of people, I can holler out to them, Nathan, Joel, they immediately turn and, and look to, where did that come? They know my voice in the midst of all of that commotion. Or if someone else sings one of my songs and they record it, and it, and it might be a great recording, if I put it on, they'll say, that's not you. Well, it's the same notes, it's the same key, it's the same words, it's the same everything, but that voice is not this voice because they've spent so much time with this voice that all the other voices, they might say the same thing, same key, same song, same language, but it's not this voice. They know their father's voice. You know, this is, this is the safeguard for us. We spend so much time listening to our father's voice. You know how many voices there are in the world? There's the voice of the enemy. There's the voice of our flesh. There's the voice of the world. But then there's also the voice of our father. And the, the more time we spend listening to our father's voice, we still hear all those other voices, but we pay no attention to them. Do you know that at a, at a bank, they, uh, and you've probably heard this before, when they're training tellers, you know, the person who stands behind the counter and deals with money all day, counts out all those, those bills, whether the Deutsche Marks or dollar bills or whatever, they don't spend any time training those people what a false dollar bill, what a false document feels like. They spend all their time with the real thing. And so when the false one comes up, they're, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't smell like. I mean, it, it looks pretty good. You hold it up to mm, that. What? And so this is our safeguard. This is why I love worship. Spend so much time in worship. Hearing the Father's voice, worshiping him, bowing down, and spending time in intimacy that when the false voice comes, it's like, eh, uh, something's, something's grating. You know, you can be in a meeting and someone's got a word, a prophetic word, and you're listening and you say, the Lord says, well, okay. And the more they talk, the more your spirit's going, eh. You know, something's scratching me on the inside. It's getting uncomfortable. <sighs> mm, no, because you know the real thing. So when the fake comes, you really don't need, you don't need to spend your time there. Okay, wow. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, he hears his father's voice and the strange voice, he gives no attention. Here, I, I love this. What's Abraham's response? What's the response of a worshiper? He says, here I am. What's that in Hebrew? Hineni, yeah. And Hineni, Hineni is more than just here I am. Hineni is more, when I uh, was raising my sons, um, and I'd speak to them, I'd say, Nathan. And you know the natural response of a young person? Yeah. Well, in America, yeah, like, what? Yeah, what? Uh, I said, uh, no, son, this is, this is not a covenantal response. This is not how a son responds to his father. So from early on, when I would teach him, I'd say, Nathan, or son, he is supposed to turn from whatever he's doing, face me, and say, yes, sir. I say, ah, now I know 
I've got your attention. Yes, sir. This is more like, yes, sir. Hineni is more like, yes, sir. In the United States, a lot of our kids grow up um, being taught street talk. They learn how to respond from their peers rather than being fathered or trained. So we have a whole society. I grew up in the 50s, <clears throat> in the 1950s and the 1960s in a very rebellious generation. The Vietnam War is going on and the hippie movement at the same time the Jesus, Jesus movement is happening. But we were a very rebellious kind of generation. We, we had the free love thing going on and drugs was coming in to our society through the rock and roll music. The Beatles really was responsible for introducing a lot of junk to us in, in those years, those formative years. So now we have a whole society my age that grew up very rebellious. We didn't know how to respond. We, we hated um, leadership and we wanted to do our own thing. So what did it produce in us? It didn't produce a generation of worshipers. And so when we spoke to one another, thank you. Actually, my little pause was not because my voice was tired. It's because when I thought of growing up in the 50s and what year it is now, I realized I'm older than I thought I was. <clears throat> and just for a moment, I said, wait a minute. In fact, this year, I just turned, the Beatles wrote a song Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Boom, boom. This year I turned 64. So back then, that was really old. Right now, it is just getting a second wind, baby. Look out. <clears throat> we are tearing it up. <clears throat> so Hineni is, is not, yeah, what do you want? Hineni is, yes, sir. In fact, my understanding of Hineni is, you have my full attention. Nothing that is um, uh, around me distracts me. And everything that I have is now available to you, Hineni. So when, I, when the Lord speaks, I often will say to him, Hineni, here I am. Here I am. Now, because this thing is a covenant, and we have a few minutes, let me just show you the other part of that covenant. So the Lord speaks. Abraham says, here I am, Hineni. You have my full attention. Nothing around me is going to distract me. And everything that belongs to me is now available to you. Keep your finger there in Genesis 22. And turn with me over to Isaiah. Wow. I was only one page off to Isaiah chapter 58. Let me just show you this about the word Hineni. I love this covenant thing, don't you? It's a two-way street. It's not just a matter of what can I do for you. <clears throat> In fact, God doesn't need anything that we have. Um, we could go back further, but look at verse 8 and following. This is Isaiah chapter 58, verse 8. Talking about a true fast here, but he says, Your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. I love that. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory, the kvod Adonai, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and I, the Lord, will answer. You will cry for help, and I will say to you, Hineni, here I am. You have my full attention. I'm not being distracted by myriads of angels and all the stuff that's going around and the weird thing in front of me with all the eyes covering me and the ones that are holy, 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 and the angels flying back and forth and all the stuff of heaven. Because you called to me, because you're a worshiper, because you're faithful. When I speak to you and you say, Hineni, when you call to me, I, the Lord, will say to you, Hineni, 
which includes everything that is within my kingdom, is now at your disposal. Isn't that what Yeshua said? Joint heirs. We're joint heirs together with him. An heir means that anything in the house belongs to you. It's not just there for you to see. It's there for you to use. Ooh. I love this stuff. Okay, turn back with me to Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> so if we're going to be faithful, if we're going to be worshipers in spirit and in truth, number one, you're going to be what? You're going to be tested. Number two, what would we say? Good. I love people that take notes. It means it's important to them. Just discern between a temptation and a test. Because a test is there for your what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to elevate you, to graduate you. You want to pass the test so that you can go on to, to better things, right? But the temptation is there to, yeah, pass it up. Okay. And so what did we say number four about a worshiper? God speaks to Abraham. What did we say about a worshiper? Yeah, that was the one after this. Right, they hear the voice of their father. A worshiper hears the voice of their father. Yes, there's a lot of other voices out there, and you know they're there. You can hear them. You just don't pay any attention to them. Did you ever go to a dog show? Did you ever go to an obedience show? It is amazing the way some of these animals are trained. I mean, that dog, no matter how big or small, is so fixated on their owner, on their trainer, you, you, can, you can offer them a T-bone steak, you can, you can call them, you can whistle at them, you can dangle, and they are like fixed. They're sitting there waiting for that command. And that's what a worshiper is. They are fixed on the author and finisher of their faith. They're not being distracted by all the other stuff, all the bells and the whistles, the other voices. They are waiting for that voice and that voice alone. Mm. So here's verse 2. We've <laughs> How many verses in this chapter? We'll get through a couple of them. Then God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son. Here's the test. Take your only son Isaac, whom you love. Isn't that interesting? Now, Abraham has another son at this point, doesn't he? Yeah, what's his name? Ishmael. But God says here to Abraham, take your son, take your only son. What does he mean, only son? Because he's speaking covenantally. You see, in, in view of covenant, the way God thinks, he only has one son, the one that God promised him. He says, take your only son, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Here comes another aspect of a worshiper. Are you ready? Early the next morning. So what does that say to me about a worshiper? They're quick to respond. How many times, don't raise your hand, have you made a promise to God? I promise if you'll just... I, I cross my heart, hope to, I know I'll live, I promise. And then time goes by, time goes by, and next thing you know, you find that promise on a little piece of paper hidden in your Bible, and it's like, oh, I never did that, did I? I promised I was going to deliver on that. When you blessed me that I was going to tie it to that project, I, I'm going to give that to... Oh, I'm gonna, I was going to go and do, I meant to make that relationship right. And mm, one aspect of a worshiper, a faithful person, man or woman, is that when they hear the voice of God, they're quick to respond. It's one of the signs. It's one of the signs. Write it down. Quick to respond. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, he saddled his donkey, he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out on the place where God had told him about. On the third day, here's another aspect of being a worshiper. It was three days 
from the time God spoke to Abraham until he got to the mountain right around here somewhere. Right before he got to the mountain that God said, this is the place. He had three days to argue with his own flesh. He had three days of talking with his son, knowing what's coming. He had three days to be impacted by the voice of the enemy, the voice of the world, the voice of reason, if you will, to be talked out of Abraham. What the heck are you doing? This is your promise. How many years was it from God making the promise, I'm going to give you a son to this point? It's about 36 years. We don't know exactly. But Isaac is now 18 to 22 years old, something like that here. And for three days, Abraham is walking along with his son, who is by now, you know, I mean, he, he's on the front of Time magazine. He, he is the most eligible bachelor in the world. He's got the fastest camel in, on the planet. You know, he works out at the gym every day. He only eats natural foods. His mother cooks for him. He's got servants. You know, he's got a body. He's got a bodybuilder. He eats all the right dates and figs and, did, 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 and fish, no bones. I mean, this guy is like, he's a vision of Messiah, isn't he? He's born supernaturally. According to the word of God, he's the only son. He's being, his father is teaching him carefully every day what it means to be a covenant man, to hear the voice of God, to be a worshiper, to respond. And where is he learning it from? Abraham. I mean, the first dude to know the one true living God in this new world. Amazing. And so uh, it says here in verse 5, <clears throat> Oh, excuse me, on verse 4. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. A couple of things here. He says to his servants, y'all stay here. Why didn't he take the servants with him? He, I mean, there's wood to carry. There's all the stuff. There's the fire. Why? Because these guys are outside the covenant, and they have nothing to do with what's about to happen. Plus, they've been serving uh, Isaac probably all of his life, and what are they going to do? What's their response going to be when they see this 120-year-old guy, Abraham, build an altar? Now they're starting to smell a rat. Wait a minute. There's no lamb here. Puts, puts all the stones, then puts the wood on, and then binds Isaac's hands and feet and puts him up on top of the altar. What do you think these two guys are going to do? Who knows? Maybe try to stop him. And so Abraham says to him, you have nothing to do. You're outside the covenant. You have nothing to do with this. You all stay here with the donkey. Talk with the donkey for a while. Maybe he'll sing you a nice song, and, uh, and we'll be back when we finish. So he says, we're going to worship. We will worship. What's the Hebrew word there? Anybody know? Shacha. We will worship. Uh, we will worship. But the word is shacha. He says, we're going to worship. He's not saying we're going up to sing a bunch of songs, uh, even if they were Paul Wilbur songs, which probably should have been. But... No, he said he doesn't. We're going to go up there and wave banners and flags and dance around a bit. He says we're going to worship. So the word shaha, the word worship, means bow down. We are going to bow down. We are going to submit ourselves to the Spirit of God, to the voice of God. We're not going up to do anything else except to do what God has told us to do. He says, and we're going to worship, and then we will come back to you. So somehow in here, Abraham knows this son is my promise. God has said he's my heir. He's also told me to sacrifice him on an altar, but I know we're coming back down together. Whether he's going to raise him from the dead, whether he's going to intervene, Abraham doesn't know. He's just a worshiper. He's going to do what he was told to do. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, and he himself carried the fire 
and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, I'm sorry, and spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Abba. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. There's a lot in there. And for the sake of time, we're not going to spend any time on that. Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. What's his response? Hineni. Again, a covenant response, which means you have my full attention. I'm not being distracted by anything around me. And anything that belongs to me is now available to you. It's a covenant response. Here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him, for now I know. Say that with me. For now I know. Now I know that you truly fear. Another alternate word for that in English is worship. Now I know. How did God know that Abraham and Isaac, who we could go back to, as a worshiper, what was known now that wasn't known at the foot of the mountain? What was known now on top of the mountain as Abraham raises the knife? What's known there that wasn't known at the foot of the mountain? That he's a faithful man, right? That he's an obedient man. What's known? So worship to me is not just a song. How often... Do you go into a place and, and people are raising their hands and some are kneeling and some are bowing and there's banners? and That's not necessarily worship, according to my Bible. These are expressions of the heart, for sure. But God is work, looking for those who worship in spirit as well as in truth. And, and the truth in the Greek means what you see is what you get. Those who worship the Father in spirit, out of their spirit man, but those who worship him in truth is what you see is what you get. God is looking for these kinds of worshipers, that if you're bowing down on your knees, that's really what's in your heart. How, I can't tell you how often, you know, from the, from the front, you get a great vantage point. And I'll see people, you know, they're in there worshiping, kind of. They got their hands up, then, and then I watch them do this. Like, how much longer, does, how much longer are we going to do this? Yeah, okay, just about 10 more minutes. I can hang in there for 10 more minutes, you know. Someone's thinking about uh, what's on the lunch menu or can I get out of here before the Baptists get to my favorite restaurant or how much longer is this going to go on or what, whatever the myriad of thoughts might be. To worship in spirit and in truth is worship, worshiping out of the heart, but what you see is what you get. And so what was different from the bottom of the mountain to Abraham lifting his hand with the knife? He'd been told, take your son up to a mountain I'll show you and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. And so when Abraham does what he's told, Isaac gets up on top of the altar. His father binds his hands and feet, raises the knife. God says, calls from heaven. He says, whoa test is over. You both pass. You go on to be, <laughs> Abraham, you're going to go on to be the father of many nations. Isaac, you get to be second in command. You know, you pass the test. You're on to the next, to the next thing. What was it that was different from the bottom of the mountain to the top? They did what they were told. And that's what God calls worship 
in spirit and in truth. We can sing and dance all day. We can jump around and prophesy and, and all the rest. Great. But I don't know that we have really worshipped the Father in spirit and truth until we've done what we were told to do. And that's been my goal ever since. Asher taught this morning about faithfulness, a faithful one. If you're faithful in little, the Lord says, I'll make you a ruler over much. If you're faithful with that $5 bill, now I know I can trust you with a $5 million because to you, it's all the same. It's seed. It's a tool. It's just something to be faithful with. And so for a lot of years, I've asked God to prove my faithfulness by giving me a private jet. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm still, I'm still expecting. Lord, test me with that private jet. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> so I'm hoping that maybe he'll test me with just a small biplane first, and then we'll see if we can move on from there to an intercontinental. Yes, Lord. Yes. I won't have any testimonies about uh, exit rows like, like Pastor Eddie had this morning, but I won't need any because I'll have my own seat. Woohoo!